1955, no one knew who Bobby Fischer was. But in 1956, at the age of 13, Bobby Fischer played this game, and suddenly everyone knew who he was. This is Bobby Fischer's famous win over Donald Byrne, dubbed the Game of the Century. Bobby Fischer was 13 when he played this game, and he had the black pieces. Donald Byrne opened us up with knight f3, and after knight f6, we got the ready opening on the board, but we quickly transposed the English with c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, d4, castle kingside. We get bishop f4 from white, and then Bobby takes us into the Grunfeld with d5. So we started with the ready, kind of turned into the English, and now we're in the Grunfeld defense. And the Grunfeld defense for black is one of the most complex openings that you can really play. It's very, very common at the grandmaster level. Here, white played the Russian system, which is when they play queen b3, and after d takes c4, queen takes c4. It may seem a little bit strange to move your queen so much here in the opening, but that's actually the normal um, response for, for white here in this position. Here, Bobby played c6. The point of this move is to get this c pawn off of the weak c7 square, which was being kind of ganged up on by the, both the queen and the bishop. And the c6 square takes away these two outposts from this white knight. After e4 from, from white, we get knight bd7. A better move in this position simply would have been b5, putting some pressure on the queen and just forcing the queen to come back right away. But back in the 1950s, knight bd7 was a common move. And here, white continuing with their development, playing rook d1, getting that rook to the center, always a good idea. If you can push this pawn, maybe blow up in the center, this rook is going to have great control of this all-important d file. We get knight b6, putting pressure on the queen. And what do you do here as white? If you go back, just retreat with the queen, then black's going to have a move like bishop e6 with another tempo on the queen, and then the queen comes back to c2. And it doesn't really make sense to, to move your queen from d1 all the way to b3, and then up to c4, and then just to just kind of move the queen back. It seems like white's making a lot of moves with the queen. So you can't really blame Donald Byrne for playing the move queen c5 in this position. And here, Bobby just continued with his development, bishop g4, and this was really the first mistake that Donald Byrne made of the game. He played the move bishop g5, and he already moved his bishop, this dark square bishop, so there's really no point in moving it again. It just wastes time, and when you're playing Bobby Fischer, even 13-year-old Bobby Fischer, you do not want to waste time in the opening. A better move for Donald Byrne would have been something like uh, bishop e2 followed by castles, and even if you get kind of uh, into a little bit longer line here, like uh, bishop takes, bishop takes, and then uh, the knight coming to, uh, to d7, the queen come back, and then you can attack in the center. It doesn't really matter what happens here. As long as white always has that option to castle right away, they'll be just fine. So Donald Byrne missing that opportunity, and instead of playing bishop e2, which would have been a really great move, he played kind of the dubious bishop g5. And the reason why this is um, kind of a dubious move is because it allows Fisher to really go on the attack. And so Fisher played the really fantastic knight a4. This is a really great move. It forks both the, the knight and the queen, and you may think that this knight is hanging, but let's analyze and see really what happens if white chooses to take this knight. If white plays knight takes a4, black responds with knight takes e4, and suddenly we have a pin here on the queen and the bishop. You may be thinking, oh, no big deal, we can always play bishop takes e7, and then if black takes R if the white queen, then white will take the black queen. The problem, though, is that black has this nice intermezzo move, rook e8. And after a bishop takes d8, we get knight takes c5 with check. The check has to be blocked with bishop d2. You end up losing this piece out here, and white has to move their bishop back to safety. Let's say they play a move like bishop g5, and then white black gets knight takes b2. And so the net net of all of that is that the uh, material is basically even except for black is up a pawn and black's pieces are just better developed this pawn um is it looks like it's falling this rook is under attack so just a better position overall for black and, and obviously white's king still stuck in the center and if instead you try to take with the queen after takes takes the rook comes to uh, to e8, and now where are you going to move the bishop? If you move the bishop back to you know a square like like this, you just get a discover check with the with the rook and the knight, and that's that's no fun for for white at all. So a tough position for white to be in, and a position that white really wants to avoid, and so that's why after knight a4 from Fisher. Byrne did not take the knight on a4 and instead played queen a3. Fisher continues weakening white center by removing the, this important defender of the e4 square, and so he played the move knight takes c3. And after b takes c3, we get knight takes e4 anyway. White played bishop takes e7, and you might be wondering, like, uh, isn't this better for, for white? White is going to pick off the rook. Here, Fisher played queen b6, and Byrne can't really take this rook on f8. If, if Byrne takes this rook on f8, after um, bishop takes f8 with a tempo here on the uh, white queen, 
it's really unclear where this queen has this what good squares there are for the queen if the queen tries to come back to this c1 square you just get knight captures pawn and if the queen captures you pin the queen to the king that's no fun for white and so there's really no way for white in this position to defend the c pawn so really the best move for white would actually just be to go for the queen trade but even after this queen trade You've got this uh, this knight coming here. If you try and put the, push this knight off the square, black's going to trade here. Now white's pawn structure is absolutely miserable, and black always has the option of um, of coming here with the bishop and setting up just a discovered attack that, frankly, white's going to have a difficult difficult time getting out of. So if we go all the way back to this position, after queen b6, burn realizing he cannot take this this rook even though uh, it's hanging he decides just to develop his pieces and get his king ready to castle and he plays bishop c4 here we get knight takes c3 further weakening uh, the pawns here if uh if you take this knight the problem here is that you get a move like uh rook e8 and what do you do here if the queen comes back to a3 to defend this bishop then black can uh, simply exchange here and if the queen takes the the bishop then this bishop falls, right? And so white will most likely capture back with the, B pawn, the G pawn. And then it's black to move here. Black could just play a move like uh, queen uh, c7, or they could even play a move like bishop f8. And this bishop is going to fall no matter what, and uh, it'll fall with with um, with tempo on the king. So really a miserable position for, for white to be in. And so realizing this, uh, Byrne decides not to capture back this knight, but instead plays bishop c5, uh, really uh, putting a lot of pressure on this queen. In this position, Fisher found kind of the intermezzo rook f e8 check, ensuring that white kind of loses his ability to castle. So after king f1, in here Fisher having to decide what to do with his queen. And in this position, Fisher played probably the best move of the game and a move that's been called really the best move of the century. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can find the move that Fisher played in this position. So if you found the move, congratulations. It's really unclear what to do with Black's queen, and so Fisher decided to just forget about the queen and instead go for the jugular, and he played the fantastic move bishop e6. These moves are always the hardest to find. They are kind of retreating, attacking moves, and let's analyze this move for a second. The obvious threat is that if the uh, bishop takes the queen, then uh, you take the bishop and you get uh, check, and this king is going to get thrown into a windmill, and we'll show that in a second. Why can't white simply take the bishop on e6 and, and uh, just wait? You know, black obviously can't capture back because uh, their queen's under attack. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because black has a really nice Philidor's mate tactic where after queen b5 check, the king cannot come to e1 because you just get checkmate right here on e2 with the queen because the knight covers the, the e2 square. So the king will be forced to, um, to g1, and then you get this uh, kind of classic smother mate or philidor's mate where the knight comes out to g3 and you get this doubled attack so even though the knight's being attacked by two pawns black, uh, white doesn't have the option to capture the knight if the king comes to e1 you still get checkmate on e2 because the knight covers the e2 square and so uh the king really has no choice but to go to g1 and then you get this great queen f1 check sacrifice you have to capture with the rook and then knight e2 checkmate and that is just a beautiful checkmate white's pieces really heading the king in a smothered mate and that combination where the queen and the knight work together to set up that kind of smothered mate is called philidor's mate very very famous combination and so burn not wanting to be humiliated by a 13 year old with philidor's mate decides that okay it'd be best probably not to capture this this uh, black bishop and uh, what about simply capturing the knight well the problem there is that this dark square bishop is very powerful on this long diagonal pins this pawn to the defense of uh, pins this pawn to the queen and so this bishop is undefended and so after uh, queen takes you could capture back but then you're going to lose uh, lose the queen here and um, this position is is better for for black black has uh, both bishops and black has the extra pawn and and white's king is really disjointed and they're going to have a hard time getting this rook into the game so that position doesn't win either so really the only move, uh, and really the best move for, for Donald Byrne is the move he played, and that is to accept the queen sacrifice with bishop takes b6. And this just allows Fisher to gain a ton of material really quickly. And so after uh, bishop takes c4 check, the king comes to g1, we get knight e2, and uh, the king comes back to f1, and we get knight takes d4. And this tactic right here is a windmill tactic. It is where you use the, um, the knight. Uh, to set up a series of discovered checks where the knight can kind of windmill around to as many squares as he wants to while the king is uh, being shuffled back and forth being checked. So after knight takes d4 we get king g1 again, knight e2 check resetting up the windmill, king f1 and we now we get knight c3 and we see the real importance of picking off that d4 uh, pawn was that with that d4 pawn gone now this bishop is really powerful and it covers uh, this knight on c3 kind of blocking the queen off from um, these d3 and e3 squares. 
After king g1, we get uh, a takes b6 with a tempo on the queen. And after queen b4, rook a4, just putting more pressure on the queen and defending that bishop with a really nice x-ray tactic. After queen b6, we get knight takes d1. So now this, uh, or uh, then now this rook is off the board. And here, white is trying to uh, make some space for their king with a move like h3. We get um, rook takes a2, just picking off more pieces. And after king h2, knight takes f2. And this is one theme you'll see a lot in games where you sacrifice a queen and you have a lot of minor pieces. The queen alone, even though she's a very powerful piece, really cannot defend pawns very well. Whereas a series of minor pieces working together can always pick off pawns. And that's why in the end game, anytime you can have a sufficient number of minor pieces versus a queen, you'd rather have the minor pieces. So after knight takes f2, we get rook e1. Uh, rook takes e1. And then uh, queen d8 check, we get uh, bishop f8, and then knight takes e1. And here we get bishop d5, a great move from Fisher. The idea being uh, you want to take squares away from the queen. So putting this bishop on uh, d5 centralizes the bishop, puts it on a nice outpost square, and limits the mobility of the white queen. After knight f3, we get knight e4 from, from Fisher. Uh, Fisher also could have just captured here. If you're in the end game, it's always great to just trade down and simplify, especially if you're up material. But I think Fisher realizing that his bishop's probably a little bit better than white's knight, decided to keep it on the board. And so he instead played knight e4. We get queen b8 going after that weak, this weak b7 pawn, but that's okay. Fisher will just short up with b5. And you see in this end game how Fisher really doesn't give his opponent any counterplay. White plays h4, for instance, and black says, nope, you can't push your pawns. I'm just gonna play h5. Um, White plays knight e5, the idea being that the knight will come to d7, and then the queen and the uh, the queen and the knight working together will kind of uh, attack this bishop. But uh, Fisher says, no, I'm just going to play king g7, and now this bishop's not pinned. There's no threat. And uh, here, white played king g1. If if we go back, uh, if if now if white tried to play a move like uh, knight d7, you just get bishop d6 check, uh, forking the king and queen, and that would be devastating for, for white. So we get king g1 from, from white, and bishop c5 check, and this is really one of the most beautiful mating nets uh, that has really ever been uh, cast for an opponent, and uh, the next series of moves were all, all four. So after king f1, we get knight g3 check, uh, king e1, bishop b4 check, king d1, bishop b3 check, king c1, knight e2 check, king b1, knight c3 check, king c1, and there are two ways to end the game here. You could uh, checkmate with uh, bishop a3, but Fisher chose the more in-your-face approach, and he played rook c2 checkmate. So there you have it, the game of the century. Really an incredible game from Bobby Fisher, who was just 13 years old, and um, he wasn't quite yet a grandmaster. I think he became a grandmaster at the age of 15, and this game just really put Bobby on the map. You can see the picture on the screen here, uh, and it was actually a, a a kind of a picture of the score sheet from that game, that Bobby score sheet, which is actually published in the newspaper in New York. So a really incredible game. So many uh, great uh, tactical uh, kind of sac peace sacrifices from, from Bobby, and Byrne couldn't take any of them because Bobby had a tactical compensation for, for really all the pieces that he was uh, he was giving up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for uh, following this channel, for liking, subscribing, for sharing these videos. I'll see you guys next week.